Hello, how's it going everybody? This is Etho and welcome back. Thank you for joining me today for this special milestone episode. That's right, we have hit episode 550. Oh, snappers, <laughs> that's a big number. Uh, we're almost at the nine year mark now in the series. Just about, we're like m one month away from that. And just about the 10 year mark for uh, the series, if you include the previous map we played in as well. So we've been at this for quite a bit of time, guys. And uh, as many of you know, every 50 episodes, we try to do a world tour. We go and uh, check things out in the world, see what's changed, what we built, stuff that's broken, unfinished projects, all the fun stuff. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I guess to get us started today, I think I'm going to smack you guys with the go get your snacks <laughs> because it's going to be a long episode. The last world tour was an hour and a half long. And in the last 50 episodes, we have built far more than we have in any previous 50 episodes. We've done a lot, a lot more stuff to see. And I'm going to have to talk faster, tell fewer horrible jokes, and just get through this as quick as we can. Uh-huh. So what better way to start off our tour than a long, drawn-out history on how this series began? Season 1 started December 17th, 2010 in a world that we called Chocolate Island. That ran from episodes 1 to 104 until the Minecraft release officially came out and that introduced many new terrain changes, which broke our previous world pretty badly and we decided to upgrade to a new world, which started Season 2. That's the one we're on currently, which began in Episodes 105 to now. And uh, yeah, I guess that kind of brings us to the point of these world tours. Why do we do them? Well, it's for, uh, you know, people that watch the series, it's kind of nice to go back and check out some builds, maybe that we don't see too often. It's a bit of a nostalgic trip. Try to give some background information on some stuff. Maybe you'll learn something new you didn't know before. But uh, mainly these world tours are for new people. That might be you. <laughs> uh, for, uh, for someone joining into this series, it can be a little daunting to start at episode 550. Oh, there's so much stuff we're missing out on, right? Well, no, we're trying to condense all our key builds down to a single episode so that you can check out stuff and get caught up with everybody else. And maybe this will be... A good time for you to join in and watching the series if you like what you see and if you want some uh, a backlog of content maybe go back 50 episodes or so and start watching from there anyways i think we're ready to begin our tour here we're going to start off with the man cave this was our first base and still kind of our main base in the world i, ju I just can't get away from this place i love it so much uh we began the world starting off in a cave and kind of liked it you know so i decided i want to build my base down here and whenever I build a base in this game, I try to set certain restrictions to try and make it more interesting. So one of them was like all the builds have to be underground. We got to use grass for our floor. So I, I grew the grass down here. This was back before Silk Touch was in the game. All the grass had to be grown. And also I set a rule that I don't want to use any torches in the finished areas. It's got to be all hidden lighting. The grass and the nature theme of our base really worked out in our favor though in that regard because... We didn't have carpets and a lot of other ways of hiding lighting in the past, so that we were pretty much limited to like hiding it under water or pressure plates. Or uh, a big one that I used throughout the base here that works well with the nature theme is hiding it under leaves. We got bushes all over the place with lighting underneath, and that does the trick for the most part. Also, in a lot of places in the ceiling, there's lighting. There's a daylight sensor thing up there that turns the light on during the day, and that goes off at nighttime. Um, let's check out our, our storage room here. We still use this to this date. <laughs> Many people want me to move on, but I just love this thing so much. The shutters open up and then the exposes the hidden lighting behind the chests and lightens up the room. A lot of people like that. Uh, in these chests, we have a little bit of everything. Oh, that's our nighttime song. See the light went off over here now. Oh, yeah, it can be tough, everybody. Living in a cave, never seeing the sky. You don't know what time it is. You run out the door and you get creepered right in the face. Not with the nighttime song. We know it's nighttime now. And we also have a daytime song that triggers in the morning. And uh, we're going to be switching into creative and spe spectator mode throughout this tour. A lot of people get confused about this. We do play the series in survival on hard mode with no mods, no data packs, no... Optifying nothing. This is vanilla Minecraft. 
But for the world tours, I create a backup and that's what we're on right now. So we're free to destroy stuff and go into creative and all that kind of stuff. So these are the, our day and nighttime songs up above us. They get triggered by a daylight sensor right over here. And of course, with every storage room in this game, you need to have an ender chest nearby. We got that under the water. Anvil hidden over here. And you need a crafting table as well. That pops out of the ground like a so. And also, it's nice to have a smelting room next to your storage room. So that is what this is over here. We can smelt stuff. Every time we put in something, it plays a little tune. The light turns on. And also, uh, these lights over here turn on if anything's smelting in the room. Hmm. I just realized these might be backwards. I think they're supposed to play the tune when they finish smelting. <laughs> so you know they're done even if you're not in the area. But uh, I guess just the light turns off. We got wire access over here if we want to check out how the redstone works. Uh, I made the smelting room back when bud switches were new in the game. Block update detectors. Um, now we have observers which replace those for the most part. And as our world ages, we try to keep our older builds looking pretty much the same as they did originally, but we do make a little modifications. You can see we got a stone cutter here now and a grindstone, lanterns, shulker boxes in the ceiling. <laughs> Those weren't, weren't there nine years ago, I tell you that. Uh, up the stairs here, we have one of our, the very first farms we built in the world, the pop-up sheep farm. Um, we added this section a little later in the series once hoppers came out. But uh, the idea is we can run along here and shear our sheep like a so. Some of our builds in the world have uh, broken due to updates, and this is one of the farms that definitely has many times. Because <laughs> it uses so many different game mechanics, which keep changing. Um, but we tried to fix stuff in this world as well, so I think at the moment this is working, but not as good as it did originally. Always interrupting me. So the way this farm works is we got a block above the sheep to hold them in place. They're about a block and a half tall, so they can't get out of this, this airspace here. And uh, originally when we would shear the sheep, the wool would always land within a 3x3 three three area. Now we can jump outside of that a bit. Um, and then we would use water to push the wool down a grate here. And it would always land on the pressure plate. <laughs> now it can get stuck on the fence, rarely. And when it would trigger the redstone, the sheep goes down and then uh, grass grows to the dirt block there, triggers a bud switch, and then when they eat it, it triggers it again and they pop up. So let's just head to the end here where we got our controls. So we, there's a water bucket control over here. Sends water down to push the wool down the grates. And then all the sheep that have their wool sheared would go down and reset. The ones that didn't have it sheared before would stay, but you can see it's a little little broken. <laughs> so we also have a manual override to get everybody down. Uh-huh, and then when they regrow their wool, they pop up, the lights turn back on. Above here, we got the water system. The pistons move out of the way and drop the water down. We do it that way so the piston kind of matches the wood color up there. And then below, we got our two-stage bud switches. I designed myself. I was pretty proud of them at the time. <laughs> which uh, trigger when the grass grows and they eat it. And then we also have the water below those pressure plates over here. Let's go creative. That's where the wool ends up going. Let's just spawn some in here. Test this. It runs down a channel on both sides. Water on ice over here. And it goes to a dropper elevator right over here. Up to this chest. And then you can see it's ending up in here and it gets collected together and then we manually take it out and put in the different colors. And shockingly, this is the only sheep farm we've ever made in this series. I do plan on eventually making a new one with the shears and dispenser mechanic that's sort of newish. But uh, this has been sufficient so far for me actually because I don't build with wool very often. But if I need a lot of it, this is definitely going to be disappointing because <laughs> it's not that fast. Uh, over here, we got our Ender Pearl station loaded up with Ender Pearls over there. And then we stand here to get them. Pretty nice. I use this thing all the time. Um, downstairs, we have multiple branching paths in our world. Endermen stealing our stuff, as usual. Another one of our very first farms. This is pretty gimmicky. Uh, mushrooms would grow in there, and then the water would harvest them. Now they grow out here. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, we got a jukebox station. We can we can put records in here. 
lights turn on when we do that. So the general idea with the man cave was to fill up any empty spaces we might have with contraptions or farms or anything we want to build, and then link those together with paths, and then finally decorate them and make them look nice. And honestly, I think that's the most practical way of playing this game. Like, I've made many bases since then. I find this works a lot better than, like, pre-building a base and filling it. This is the very first enchanting station I ever made in this game, guys, and I'm pretty sure this is the first enchanting table I ever crafted, actually. Still got it. Still know where it is. Um, that's another cool thing about having an old world. It's like, oh yeah, that was the first time I did that, the first time I did that. <laughs> Brings up a lot of old memories, you know? Uh, so, in the past, it took 50 levels to enchant something, and you needed 30 bookshelves, not just 15 like you do nowadays. And when you enchant the things, your levels went all the way down to zero. So, uh, a lot of times people would block out the enchanting table with torches. And the way I decided to do mine, since I was a redstoner at heart, you know, uh, I decided to hook up some sticky pistons to the bookshelves, and then you have a fine control over what levels you would get. I keep a lot of junk up here as well in these. I think I added this later, this stuff up here. Um... But yeah, you could control the levels easily that way. Uh-huh, and this is a little hard to explain, but we have a man-made river running through our base, <laughs> which uh, originally the plan was to have a water transportation system, like a boat road running through the whole base, and it just never worked out. Um, and we ended up just keeping this here as like a decorative thing and a way of getting around. We got lily pads over top of it. We can walk across, which is kind of cool. Back over here again, this is like the part we branched out to shortly after we did this area. Uh, we got a pumpkin and melon farm, very simple one. Step on it, pistons push the ground up. This used to shoot out a hoe at the end here we would use to till the ground because originally pumpkins and melons would not grow on regular dirt like this, it had to be tilled. And then we would step on this, it would go down, and they would grow again. We can store our stuff over here. Something that is true even to this day, everybody, is whenever a new block comes out in this game, it never fails. That's the block I gotta build with. It's my new favorite thing. I think sandstone was the hot block for a long time. And then when I generated this world, it was the same time that nether fortresses came out in the game. Mm-hmm. And also, I believe it's the patch that introduced the end, the strongholds. So that's what we got in the walls. <laughs> and, uh... Also, abandoned mine shafts. I think came out, all came out in the same patch. So, of course, we built the base, the man cave, in a giant abandoned mine shaft, and there's still the remnants behind here. We got a dual cave spider spawner somewhere. Is it over here? Oh yeah, here's the other one. There's one. There's two. And uh, when we stand over here, it uh, activates both of them. For a long time, this is where we used to kill them. There was a crushing system here, and we ran them up a spider elevator thing I designed. It, go, it brings them up. There's a whole wacky thing. It goes up over here, and then I think this came from the other spawner. They merged together. It keeps going. It keeps going. There's a horse over there. <laughs> and then it would drop them down, get them down to a one-hit kill. And somehow I managed to make it where they wouldn't stick to any walls and stuff. Oh, it was amazing. This was my main XP farm for a very long time. Pistons were also fairly new in the game at the time we were building this. I think they came out one patch before the official release back in the beta. And of course, the hot thing was uh, spiral elevators. So these would these would push you up. They don't work anymore, <laughs> as you can see. But it would like it would bring you up like this. It would push you onto stairs. And of course, every base needs an ugly brick thing, so we got our ugly brick thing over here. Look at this, infinite water. Incredible. Amazing. Crafting all in one station. The water doesn't flow out because we got the pressure plate here. Yep, yep. Hidden lighting. Oh, man. Just, just incredible, guys. You didn't see that there, did you? Nope, it's there. Uh, we got uh, run faster for speed potions. We got live longer for the instant health. And don't forget about the hidden chest behind the lava. That's what we would use to refill these when they would run out. Because we built this before hoppers were a thing. You had to manually refill things back then. <laughs> it was really annoying. 
Uh, don't forget to also about testificates. You guys remember that? Before villagers became villagers, they didn't trade at all. They did absolutely nothing in the game for a very long time. And the goal was to collect all six different guys, different colors, in Project Pokemon here. Um, never did it, though. And we can't do it anymore, so these are empty. Got some secret chests here for trading stuff with them. We got paper for the paper trade. We have a button to cycle through... The guys is broken now. They take damage a little bit when they get switched, but uh, yeah, kind of cool. Secret ender chest. That's the crafting table. Secret ender chest. Aha. <laughs> uh, we got a two by two door here. This leads over to um, Emerald City. The plan was to put a village over here and to make it all technical and crazy. And uh, oh my goodness, my eyes. Look at this place, right? Incredible. Absolutely amazing. So we would drop the villagers down over over here. Then we carted them over with the mine carts to our village. And then they were forced to live in these rooms. And now I use this for storage. <laughs> there is still one iron golem here from the ancient days, though. Um, and there was also the well. I think there's a villager down here still. There's two. These guys are ancient, ancient. I don't remember how this stuff all works, to be honest. It was so, so long ago. But yeah, I had a big plan in mind with all of this. Like, we spent a lot of time working on this. I had to mine out the whole area. Uh, we had a whole system up above here for the villagers. They would get dropped down through the water. And there was like a storage system and a way of moving them through the nether. Whoop! I broke it. Um, they would get held in these areas and then drop down... To these spots. Oh, that was just for Project Pokemon, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, it's abandoned. We don't think about that anymore. <laughs> we almost never see it. Something else that we abandoned, but is so much cooler, was our original potion room. Uh, back before brewing was automatable, uh, we came up with a system here that's pretty cool. We got the 3x3 door with the hole in it. Uh, we got some storage here for the potions. This is like our random junk stuff. Um, you can see it's color-coded behind the chest. There's some wool, so blue for swiftness, and orange for fire resistance, and regen. That was pretty cool. We got some pixel art in the floor, as well as our main brewing area over here. So the idea is we would stand underneath the water, and if we wanted glass bottles, we'd hit the top button. And funny enough, with the way the game is now, this actually gives us filled water bottles. <laughs> That's uh, not what originally happened. Um, you would get glass bottles, and you this was within reach. So you'd hold right-click, and then they would get thrown up like this and filled. And then you would use those to fill up the brewing stands. All of the brewing stands are within reach. You don't have to move at all to get to them. And then, like, if you wanted nether wart, you would get the nether wart. I guess there's only one left. <laughs> if you wanted uh, redstone or gunpowder, you would hit this, and... Uh, then you'd pick your final ingredient, sugar maybe, for swiftness potions. Everything would get dispensed in this one spot. You'd brew your stuff and then store it over here, which was neat. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to make in this work. There's a massive storage room above here. Uh, droppers weren't out in the game yet, so we used dispensers. And that is why we're getting uh, water bottles now, because <laughs> it's uh, glass bottles in the dispensers at the water here. Kind of interesting. Dispensers are about thank you sign. Um, I guess that's for the door. Um, yeah, anyways, the way we would get to the room over there is through the gold door. Man, these Endermen are driving me crazy. And there's a hopper minecart underneath the block there. It would pick up the stuff. Go through, step on the pressure plate to close the door, and you can access all the storage here and refill it and stuff. Moving on, we got ourselves a bit of a wacky build, the UFO, <laughs> with the cow farm below. This was our main source of food for a long time. Eventually, we found a mushroom island and moved those guys over there as well. But we had a whole thing for fishing. We would stand here. It's like a little mini game. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work anymore. Can we get one at least? Oh, we got one. We would fish him up, and they would go into the water above and then float into a holding system. 
Oh yeah, so you can see we got flowing water that goes this way. Then it would merge in the middle. They would go over here, fall down into a fenced area, and this is where we would kill them. And something else cool about this cow farm is this square you see, this was actually part of the abandoned mine shaft. You know those weird square rooms? That's what this is. We turned it into a cow farm, which we can get to over here. We got a way of going down. We got some dispensers for looting. We got uh, that for tilling the crops. Oh yeah, we used to plant wheat and stuff here too. We got seeds and the wheat there. But generally we would uh, feed the guys. We would go down here after we killed them. Let's kill a couple. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have a bunch of pistons holding water up, I believe, over here. And then we would retract those when we hit the button. Oh, a lever. Never mind. <laughs> that would pull the pistons back. The water would flow down. Because, again, you couldn't, like, keep water buckets and dispensers or anything like that. Um, all the drops would fall down to the center and then get pushed towards us. And also, there was an old trick in the game. If you had fences below tilled farmland, you couldn't trample it. And that was amazing. But they removed that pretty shortly after it was discovered. Uh, and then there's also a way of getting back up over here. Once upon a time, we had two testificates in our world named Tom and Jeff that ran our potion lab for us. Then one day, Jeff killed Tom, so we trapped them in a cage above a lava pool. We used to point and laugh at him, until one day he just disappeared. The end. Uh, we have our cave spider spawners we can view through here. As well as a, a slime pad we built, so another big change around the time we made this world was... Slimes used to only spawn at like Y minus 16 or less. Then they changed it to Y 40 and less. So we made a spawning pad in a slime chunk. They jump off the pad into the water streams around here. Slimes used to sink so that they'd fall down these holes and die. Um, but now they just float over top of them. And they go up an elevator here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. A whole big thing here. <laughs> There's also like some lava blades and stuff I think we used to have in here, but we got rid of it. small slimes fall down a one by one area and then the medium ones medium ones down a two wide area and then there's the big boys that land over here and they end up in this spot and then there's also a minecart system which I think is empty at the moment that would pick up the slimes they would go down here a couple uh, renegades they'd fall down and then they run around the track underneath some uh, slabs. And the reason we did this is just because it looked funny. And they kind of push you around. So when the big guys here go into the minecart, we can watch it fall down and, and go along here. And also, that we had a whole system for when they would despawn and the minecarts would become empty. There was a way of detecting that and the empty minecarts would go back into the system. They'd ram into a cactus and go into the dispenser here to be reused. So it was a whole, whole big thing, and also there's a viewing window for that over here. Okay, so we got a lot of stuff to cover in the man cave. Let's keep going here. Uh, we haven't gone down this path yet. This is to an empty room. This is unfinished, as you can tell. The idea was something out of uh, Donkey Kong Country, the big horde of bananas. We were going to stash a big pile of diamonds here or emeralds, but never ended up doing it. Then I wanted to store my broken tools here. We got a few of them, but then they introduced mending into the game, so yeah, <laughs> it's like a unfinished area. Got a branching path that goes across our river, goes down here, it's a little decorative area. We don't build a lot of new stuff in the man cave anymore, but recently we added a bunch of stuff here, except for the vine wall. This was here for a long time. So we get our shears, vines grow against the wall. Sometimes they land in the water, most of the time they don't. And then there's hoppers below to pick them up. This is a very odd contraption. There, we have a long history of burning diamonds in this series, so we made a contraption just for that when the blue fire came out in the game. You get the diamond, you throw it in the fire, and it turns blue. Incredible. And then we hit this one so we can burn more diamonds. Uh, we made a fern farm recently as well. Uh, with this one, we load up some ferns in our offhand, and then we get our shears and just hold right click and left click every so often. The dispensers bone meal the ferns so that they grow tall, and then you get two ferns each one of those, and 
get more that way. And they end up in here. Uh, also, we added a concrete maker recently. This was a bit of an oddball idea I had, so we built it somewhere in the world. We could maybe forget about it if we wanted to. <laughs> we do the layers again. Like so, when we land on the pressure plate, it shoots out a TNT. And usually in that time, we have it all loaded up if we don't pause. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then... <laughs> It's pretty good if you get into the rhythm, but that was pretty bad. Bad example of it. But yeah, it gets blown up in a blast chamber here and all funnels down into the chest. There's also a chicken farm over here, which uh, is a bit odd as well. We don't really have a good chicken farm in the world. This was supposed to be for a mini game where they would shoot the eggs out and we would shoot the chickens as they fall down. The way the man cave is laid out, it makes it kind of tough to go in order. So we're back over here again. We're going to go to another old build. A very old, important build, the tree farm. Look at the tree farm, guys. This thing is super important to our world. Not really it, but the people behind it, guys. So if you don't know the story, a long time ago on YouTube, when I first started, you couldn't really make any money doing YouTube. The partnership program was brand new at the time. Um, things like Machinima were around, but oh, they were sketchy. <laughs> I almost joined Machinima at one point, and then... It's like the guy that was recruiting me asked me to join on, on Xbox 360 to play Call of Duty or something, and I didn't want to because uh, Transformers War of Cybertron was my game. I was like one of the top in the world at that game, and then he was like making fun of me for it, playing some kitty game, even though it's not a kitty game. It's an amazing game. Um, <laughs> anyways, it seemed really unprofessional to me, so I... I opted out of joining Machinima, but I watched the movie Social Code, and it's like, man, I gotta start thinking of ways of making money in my life, and I almost quit YouTube for a while, and I thought, let's just open it up uh, to donations and see what happens, and oh my goodness, guys, we got a lot of donations. Every one of these trees represents someone amazing that sent me money in the early days, helped keep me motivated and making videos, and eventually we did get partnered and uh, started making money through ads, and then we stopped taking donations once uh, that became sustainable. But uh, we still have their memories here, and I, I thank everyone for that, because that made a huge difference. <laughs> uh, also, uh, along the tree farm here, we got a cool mural, different biomes in the game. We got, like, the taiga cold biomes on, on this side of the wall. Then we got the hotter biomes over here, desert, mesa, little... Uh, Rice Cannon or whatever. I don't know. We got a sand temple miniaturized as well as like the forest and plains and stuff on this side. It's a little bit tough to see it when the trees are grown in here, but I've always been a big fan of the ceiling design we did in here as well. Uh, it's, it's a simple design, but it looks pretty cool, I think. And over in the corner, we also have uh, a grass farm. What would you call this again? Flower farm sort of thing. You hit start. You get stuff loud. You hit stop. Hit the button up there. Water gathers it together. And then uh, we can store it. There's also composting for anything extra we get that we don't want. And uh, yeah, we upgraded this recently. So now it's faster and does Nylium and stuff. So it's pretty cool. Those of you that have been watching the recent Hermitcraft episodes, you know I've gotten uh, pretty good with note blocks. <laughs> That's not always been the case, though. Uh, I've always been a big fan of note blocks. Didn't know how to use them for a long time. But even uh, during the series here, I have tried making some note block songs, and some of them turned out pretty good. I think it's Moon Song from Cave Story. If you leave the trap door up, it, it keeps playing in a loop as well. Um, over this way is our netherwort farm. Ooh, we built this when the magma blocks were introduced in the game. And the netherwort, I believe, as well. <laughs> new blocks, guys. New best block in the game. Got to use them. Uh, there is a button over here for harvesting. Press to harvest. That shoots up the water. 
and funnels them all to the center where they go down a hole. Water shuts off, and then we gotta manually replant because there's no way of automatically doing it. Not yet in the game, anyways. And then they go up a dropper elevator, goes up and then down into the chest on this side. Excellent. So I think we covered most of the stuff in this area. We're not done with the man cave. No, no, no. <laughs> there's still a lot left to go. But this area is done. Uh, down this way, we have the ender porter. We'll get more into that later. We also have a path that leads to the stronghold base, and I think this connects to the guardian farm. Although I might have covered that up recently. Then uh, this was just a open space we had, so I put something here. We got a flower farm. Super fast. <laughs> Slimes always jump on the pressure plates and trigger it when I don't want them to, and legs of the world. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's great design, guys. Uh, you can see our cave spiders. Oh yeah, and this is where we actually get the drops from these guys, so let's go check this out. So they used to go up the spider elevator, and then we changed it so they just fall down. They land on the trip wires, and then that makes the minecart get moving here. It picks up the drops through the slabs, and deposits them in the chests. And uh, the other one's set up exactly like that as well. And it's got a little creeper face design on the slabs. Um, fishing got improved in the game at one point. It used to only get fish, just the regular standard fish, and then they added the looting and leer. Yeah, I think that's the two. <laughs> so we made a fishing shack where we could, uh, just fish. Yeah. Uh, this is the man-made river. It kind of branches out through different places in the base as well. So it comes down to the fishing shack and fills up the pond. And we also have the river branching down here. It creates a small decorative waterfall, which I think looks pretty nice, down to the lower section. Uh, this area is mostly decorative, but we do have a little bit of a farm here. This used to be a rabbit farm, which is why we planted the carrots all around it. Um, in the past, you had to tie them to fences on leads. Otherwise, I think they would get away or despawn or something was weird with it. And then uh, you would feed them through here. Some remnants still remain. <laughs> I think they all disappeared eventually. I don't know why. But uh, then there was some stuff for... Oh, I think we'd use the water so they'd hop around and make it easier to feed them. And then there's poison <laughs> to get them down to... I don't know, a one-hit kill or something? And that was for collecting the drops or something? I don't know. It's all very confusing. Um... Eventually they all disappeared though, so we turned this into a pig farm who also eat carrots, so it worked out great. This goes down further. This is mostly unfinished down this way. But uh, we did put down an eats road in here as well, which is a transportation system I invented a long time ago. Doesn't work in the game anymore, but you could ride boats down a track. I'm a pretty big fan of branching paths, if you couldn't tell. So at the intersection, we can also go this way. This leads over to the creeper face, and uh, oh, we just saw it shoot arrows out of its eyes. That's cool. Back up to this way. Um, we got two important things along here. This is a part of our snowball fountain system, and also snow snow farm. So you left click with the snow shovel, hopper minecart automatically picks up the drops, and then they funnel down to a system below, and. This is a mini farm, the very first one we built in our world. Check this out. You stand on the pressure plate. Piston moves the dirt up and down like that. Hold right click and then the dispensers are full of bone meal. They grow the crop and you get a little extra every time. Amazing. Um, also works with wheat, potatoes, even beetroot seeds, guys. Look at that. We get beetroot like crazy. And the cool thing about this one is... Uh, Pressure plates on a jungle log, so you can use it to grow cocoa beans, too. The very first thing we ever built in this world was the lava creeper face thing you see before us. Lava, larva, lava, whatever weird way you want to say it. Uh, the idea behind this was to pay homage to our first world, the Chocolate Island. We had a giant creeper face in the middle of our base, so we built another one in the middle of this base. Behind it is our nether portal to get to our nether hub. And it's very treacherous to go through it, <laughs> always. But I've gotten into the habit of doing it properly now. Um, behind the window here is our very first horse, Zenith. We used him to fight a wither one time, and he actually survived. It was like 
incredible. That's the snowball fountain I've been talking about. It has a player detector on it, so it only fires when we're nearby. Uh, also, you saw it shot arrows out of its eyes. That's controlled over here. We have a way of refilling um, the arrows, and then uh, there's a randomizer for it as well and stuff. Oh, there it goes. And now we arrive at the moment many of you have been waiting for. Through this tunnel lies our very best friend in the world because it's a single player and he doesn't talk, so he's the best we can settle for. Wilson, our Tamagotchi pet in Minecraft. Wilson! Yeah, so the idea behind Wilson is he's sort of like a mini game within Minecraft. Our goal is to keep him alive as long as possible and over time his age bar ticks down and you want it to get to the very end if possible, but it's difficult. He takes a lot of a lot of maintenance, a lot of care, because he's got these different stat points. Um, he's got a weight bar, a happiness bar, and a hunger bar, and then also a health bar, which factors in the other three, and does some math and decides if the health should go up or down every update. Um, so if all his uh, stats are in good shape, his health goes up. If they're in bad shape, his health goes down. Uh, also, as his health goes down, he's more likely to get sick. And he's sick right now, you can see, because he's got a zigzaggy mouth. In order to cure his sickness, and he gets a major health penalty when he's sick, like this drains a lot faster. So in order to cure him, you got to feed him golden apples. Uh, one second. <laughs> uh, he's got a way of preventing it so you can't feed him too often. And it was, it was, it was out, so we couldn't feed him at the moment. But uh, yeah, if we feed him a golden apple, it cures his sickness. Now he's just kind of sad because his health is low. Um, in order to get him happy, we got to keep him in good shape for a while. So one way of doing that is by feeding him. You got to get his, his hunger up to five bars. Mm -hmm. And you can feed him cookies as well. Cookies give him less food, but boost his happiness and also increases his weight faster than normal as well. Uh, the idea with the weight was to keep it balanced. You don't want it too high or too low. Otherwise, he would lose health. And <laughs> the really cool thing about Wilson is he's got lots of different expressions he can make. Let's uh, just run through those. So at five lights on with the health bar, he's got the super happy expression. At four lights, he's still looking pretty happy. At three lights, he's neutral. Two lights and he's sad. At one light, he's just wishing for death at this point. And if you neglect him, if you don't take care of Wilson, his health bar will drain all the way down, and then he gets the dead face, where his eyes are closed. He's got the zigzag, kind of like the sick face. But uh, once, he, once he dies, you cannot revive him. His heart stops beating, and it doesn't matter what you do, his age bar stops ticking, and that's your final score. All right, good stuff. So let's go take a look behind the scenes. What's going on in Wilson's body? A whole lot of redstone. <laughs> so... The history behind Wilson is we started working on him around the time the Redstone update came out. That's when we got hoppers in the game, comparators, and I think maybe droppers, but I don't remember. And I got super excited about all the new possibilities about what we could do with the new features. And I wanted a technical challenge, so that's where Wilson uh, started being made. And while working on him, I figured out lots of cool stuff, like how to do variables, counters in Minecraft. Um, we got a... Sickness randomizer based on health levels. So this is a variable randomizer depending on his health level. He's more likely to get sick It like operates in three different stages um, also uh, So that's like his immune system. He's got a stomach So as we feed him it takes a while for him to digest his food if you keep feeding him before his stomach empties Then he gains weight faster um, Also, he's got a bladder system over here. I think so every once in a while he takes a poop <laughs> and then his weight drops by a bunch um, and it's supposed to like flood the room or something and you have to clean it up otherwise his happiness would go down. I never implemented that. And also a lot of people give me a lot of credit for inventing the hopper clock. It's a commonly used redstone circuit in the game and I m invented that while working on Wilson actually. This is the I think the first one ever made in the game right over here. It's Wilson's heart, so this regulates how often he gets updated. It's a variable timer system. And every time it updates, it runs all the logic behind Wilson. Ah, all right, so we just have two more branches to go down in the man cave down there, and we can go down here. Both kind of blend together as well. So this leads to a viewing window for Wilson. 
can check out the redstone and this was supposed to continue on and expand the base but we haven't uh, gone beyond that yet then uh, we can go down this way to a new room this is uh, like a flooded area so we're on a pier and it's mostly just decorative we also have a horse elevator here for our horse stable again this leads back to the creeper and uh, this is where we used to keep our good horses until the slimes let a bunch of them out and they died in the water here. <laughs> That's when we moved Zenith behind the window so he'd be safe from the slimes. Uh, this I don't think works anymore, but we used to be able to ride a horse up the elevator. Hey, look at that. Maybe it does work. I don't know. Probably 50-50. Probably and then we got slimes to land on if we want to go down. Uh, through here is a mushroom farm. This is for brown and red mushrooms. And uh, it's supposed to continue on if we want to keep expanding. We've got some goodies over here for growing them. And this is also a musical mushroom farm. All right, and then from here we have another branching path that goes down to the go get your snacks machine we saw at the beginning of this episode. I've never really had a standardized intro for the series, and one episode I just started with, uh, go get your snacks. And for some reason, that caught on. People really liked it. <laughs> Always want me to say it at the start of the episode, and I'll, I'll do it every once in a while. So we made a machine there to uh, kind of visualize it. And then uh, this is an armory. You used to be able to put armor stands in minecarts. You can't do that anymore. But we had a swapping system for... Like picking them up and then another one would drop down. But uh, all the minecart stuff broke with that. Now I just store some random tools and stuff here. This leads back to that area we saw before. Yeah, so a lot of the things we've seen so far, some of them are useful, some of them not so much. But pretty much everything down this path of the man cave we use all the time. Like this is an area we frequent. This leads to Ethos Lab. This is our auto brewing system which replaced the old potion room. Um, it's complete with a netherwort farm inside, just a simple one. And there's another one over there. It's mostly for decoration though. There's the on-off switch for turning it on. Bet you didn't expect that. <laughs> These lights tell us if there's uh, awkward potions available for brewing. And basically we can brew every single potion automatically here. And it does it in a chain system. So at the start there's awkward potions. Then it adds an ingredient, and then we got night vision, then it adds the redstone, and we get extended, fermented spider eye, it becomes invisibility, and then finally splash. And at every step of the brewing process, we can pull out the potions however we want them. And some new potions got added to the game after we built this, so it doesn't actually brew everything anymore, which is a bit unfortunate. And then there's a main system here for brewing the awkward potions, if we flip this up. It'll auto-brew awkward potions, and uh, we can fill the water bottles up over here, although that is totally automated now that you can fill water bottles with dispensers. And above the potion lab is a giant minecart system for distributing the awkward potions to the different brewing areas. It goes around through these junctions and delivers the awkward potions wherever it needs it, and then returns to pick up more when it finishes. Moving on, we have another piston door on this side of the lab. This one was kind of special. It used to be able to open it by selecting a golden carrot. There was a... Oh, it does still work. Okay, never mind. <laughs> There's a rabbit hidden behind the wall that gets excited when he sees the golden carrot in your hand. That leads to this other intersection room or tunnel. This one's uh, pretty decorative, though. We got a bunch of plants on the podzol down below. Water down the middle. And you can see, like, plants hanging down from the ceiling roots from trees and I think I hit a bunch of water buckets ab above too so it like leaks down and looks like it's filling up the water below. Oh and I guess there's water coming out of the, the sides here too. <laughs> that makes more sense actually. Uh, this way is our main mob farm in the world which isn't doing anything because it's probably nighttime. Yeah it's fairly efficient but it's nothing super crazy. I think I still got a lot of dark spots actually <laughs> in this area that I gotta light up. But uh, over time, just just based on its position, we're like always near this thing. So it produces a lot of uh, bones, arrows, gunpowder, and zombie flesh if I need it. Extra drops go in there. It all gets sorted. Uh, they just drop down through a chamber. 
goes up to a bunch of spawning pads here. This is a system that uses cats, dogs, and villagers. And then they go down and down here. There was also like a way of switching what path they take. It, we could uh, make them go this way. We were building an arena at one point, but uh, never ended up finishing that or doing anything with it really. If we take a right at this intersection, it leads us to an unfinished room. This is what we call the Pixel. It's a, another tech project, a storage room system. Uh, I invented a way of searching shulker boxes to uh, find stuff. So we had like a menu where you would choose what item you were looking for. Let's say we're looking for glass. This probably doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I'm just saying. Let's see. Well, that did not sound good. No, I don't think it works at all anymore. Okay, how about this? We'll watch a clip from our old world tour when this thing still worked, and young Etho can explain it to you with the, the old microphone. Let's say we want some sand. Select it from the menu there, you throw it into the hopper, and then it'll check all those uh, shulker boxes for any that have sand in, and they should end up here. So that has sand in. And then if you want to cycle to the next box, you step on the pressure plates. This one also has sand in. Another one with sand. We got a lot of sand, apparently. <laughs> and then they end up back in here. Also, the menu item back ends up back in here. All right, well, that was a little weird, but thanks, Etho. You got me out of a jam there. So the recent redstone changes seem to have broke this thing even further. It's, it's like getting stuck and stuff now. So we might eventually tear this thing out, but the way it worked is it would take an item out of the shulker boxes and then match it with the item from the menu. It would put this into an item filter. And if any items from the shulker box came out and went into the item filter, it would know that it was a match. And then it would have to put that item back in the shulker box. And it does that at another stage. And it was a pretty complicated thing. If we keep going straight here, we reach our underground village. This was a replacement to the Emerald City thing we did. Um, we built some phony little facade houses here. This was back when uh, villagers worked in front. They had to have skylight in front of the doors to count it as a valid village. Villages don't even exist anymore, so this isn't necessary. It's much easier to do uh, underground villages now, but we uh, built a bunch of little houses around here and some weird random contraptions. We had a way of killing the villagers over here because you used to get a penalty if you killed them yourself. Where I guess you still do, don't you? <laughs> Where uh, trades cost more. There we go. Turn it on. Turn it off. We got a school. So the baby villagers used to go in here. They would get separated from the adults. And then when they would grow up, I would decide if they should live or die. They would go on to the good life if they should live, if they have good trades. If they had garbage trades, we would send them down here and they would go up to the surface and get killed by zombies. At this end of the village, we had a contraption for trading zombie flesh with our villagers which uh, isn't really necessary anymore. Um, there's a weird guy staring down at us. <laughs> I made some weird things in the past, I tell you. I don't know what I was thinking half the time. Uh, if we keep going up here, there was a zombie spawner. This used to spawn in zombie villagers. I don't think they do that anymore. And we would cure them, and then we would send the cured villagers to the village if we ever needed to repopulate it. And we also got an elevator down here. If we want to get up to the surface, we just hop on the, the llama. The Llama Vader takes us up, activates some tripwires on the way, we hop off, and uh, there we go, we're out of the man cave. Nope, not yet, we still got another branch to go down in the man cave, and then we're done with it. This is a quick one though, but man, we're at 50 minutes here. Uh, we might just need to skip the man cave in future tours, because it takes up a big chunk of the time. Uh, so behind this door is a randomizer for a firework crafting machine, we can refill the ingredients there. Um, we go down and we can access the actual room to it over here. So this is the firework factory. I don't know if this still works. I haven't used it in a long time, but you stand underneath here and I don't know. I don't even know if I remember how to use it. Yeah, it gives you the ingredients. You use those to craft your fireworks star like so, and it's random. And then once you do that, it gives you more stuff. Those then end up in storage and then you can use them to randomly craft a firework with the uh, Random amounts of stars. You can select how many over here with this item frame. How many gunpowder you want with this. Hit the button. I don't know where they come from. I guess over here. 
And it gave us a random amount of stars and gunpowder matched with uh, what we got set there. Nothing in behind there. We got uh, elevator and potion lab wire access. This is just if we need to uh, check anything out or change anything. Easy, easy to get to the stuff that way. All right, let's keep going. Got to keep moving. So we saw this already. This is above the ethos lab. We ignore that guy. Oh, actually, he can, we can use him. So check this out. <laughs> we put the shutters down and we're perfectly safe from mobs while we use one of our mini farms. Yeah, this mini farm doesn't work anymore. It used to block out the light with the slab. Now it light shines through slabs and I can't plant the crop either. There was a hopper underneath to pick up the the plants when they would pop off and uh, it was pretty nice, but it doesn't work anymore. Let's keep going. A little decorative wheat field there. And we built another mini game over here. This is like a Simon Says memory game. Never got it finished though, so let's just... Uh... All right, we killed him. When the concrete powder came out, we made a way of uh, switching walls. It's just like a fun, goofy thing. There's a bunch of different patterns. Oh man, I'm trying to do it for. And it cycles through them, but never fully hooked that up either. And then it is dead, dead ends here. Woohoo! All right, we finished up with the man cave, guys. We can move on and check out some other stuff in our world, some stuff above the surface now. And uh, we're gonna fly through the secret tunnel behind the waterfall. We made this uh, before you could rocket launch yourself with the elytra. So we had to get the slope just right to make it through. And uh, we used to have a conveyor belt system here. Um, there was a thing you could do with pistons for a long time called the piston translocation. <laughs> it was in the game for two years and they even had some updates in that time. And then they were like, oh, hey, let's remove this, uh, this feature from pistons. And it broke so much stuff in my world. I had to uh, tear out a bunch of conveyors and elevators and redo them and stuff. Oh, it's nighttime. There we go. That's better. So the tunnel brings us to the library. This is our longest running unfinished project in the world. And I kind of don't ever want to finish it just because of that. <laughs> uh, we got an enchanting station with the uh, anvils and stuff there. And this is part of a book matrix thing. We have a way of storing our enchanted books and then we, we can request them using the buttons, Aqua Affinity, let's go for a punch, and Efficiency, and then they get delivered to us right around here. There we go. You can use those for enchanting and stuff, which is, which is great. It's a little bit slow though, made that a long time ago. And uh, we got Grandma Witherbottoms up there. <laughs> Might tear that out still, I'm not sure. Yeah, so at the end of every episode, we do like a Q&A thing where I pick out a comment from the previous episode. Uh, if somebody asks an interesting question or brings up a good topic or has a good idea for me, I like to feature it as the comment of the day. And we got those arranged. Uh, every 10 episodes gets a chest and they're all in order and we got them all saved. Unfortunately, there was a bug a long time ago that deleted a lot of them. Um, so we lost a lot of information that way, but we got have them also on the other side here, the older ones. These are the ones I think that got deleted. All right, so back at the man cave entrance, I guess let's just fly up and give you an aerial view of what's going on here. So that's the library where we were just at. Um, it's a little bit uh, chaotically arranged. <laughs> uh, I would like just build random things and you know, they wouldn't really match the theme or anything. So we got like snow mixed with forest and sand all over the place. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, doesn't have a lot of cohesion to it, but uh, you know, it's our world. We've gotten used to it. This is the snowflake. When I first started in the world, I kept getting lost. I needed some kind of beacon back before beacons were in the game. So I put a giant snowflake in the sky and I could see it from a long distance and I stopped getting lost uh, around our base then. Because <laughs> remember, we we're living underground, so we had no structures above here to help locate it either. It was really, really tough. Eventually, we turned this into an iron farm as well, one of the old school designs. This is in our spawn chunks. So it would run all the time. Am I gonna die? Oh, I lived, okay. Iron golems would fall down here and then the lava would kill them, which I think I removed. Oh, I mean poppy farm. Yeah, it's a poppy farm, not an iron farm. It might be best if we just take a walk through the swamp actually. So let's go for a little stroll. We've seen this already. That's the project Pokemon and Emerald City stuff. We planted a few mushrooms here to make it feel a bit whimsical. Um, 
this is, I think, the true spawn of our world. So we used to have a way of sending ender pearls here from the end, and they would get stored without us actually having to go to the overworld. Uh, that leads to a mine shaft. We'll check that out in a second. But let's just go through the swamp. <laughs> I'm supposed to uh, plant some trees, like uh, make it look like it's connected to the canopy above. I haven't done that yet. Um, but we got some mushrooms planted throughout here. The reason I haven't done it yet is that I hate walking through this place. <laughs> I wonder why. Just get swarmed every time I go through here. It's insane. Uh huh. But we got some mushrooms. We built a mushroom house over here as well. Yeah, yeah. Got like a fireplace. A little cozy, cozily decorated bedroom upstairs. All right, we made it out of there. There's still a lot of work I want to do with that. We got to dress it up, make it look nicer. But the goal was to make the swamp biome a little bit more interesting than just the default. So this was our mine shaft, one of our first projects in the world. This goes down. We got a bunch of chests for storage. Um, this is where that Eats Road connects to from our base. And it's a pretty long tunnel, actually. We had like a snowman walking around the top here that would make the lights flicker. I don't know if he's still there. Probably not. I think that's for speed potions and healing. <laughs> and then uh, we had a way of converting boats into planks. It used to be a, a trick you could do. So you could turn like jungle logs into oak planks that way. And uh, again, kind of like the tree farm at our base, we dedicated a mine shaft to people that donated. And this is how I used to get most of my redstone before uh, speed mining was a thing. And then we can ride the rails back once we're done mining. Oh, and it still works. Look at that. Cool. And then when we wanted to get out, we could enter pearl through the lily pads. Oh, and that also still works. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. So going back to the whole using boats for transportation thing, you'll see we got a lot of water around our base. And we actually have, like, probably a good thousand blocks of water connected together. Uh, most of that is because I actually carved out... a. The river myself it's like man-made to a certain extent and we put trees along the the banks so it looks a bit nicer could ride our boat through here made a fake waterfall there and then it we joined it up to this lake where we got the you've been ethoed thing this is a throwback to the minecraft days um i think it was b-dubs that verbalized the you've been ethoed <laughs> it's like you've uh, been destroyed or you've been beaten sort of thing um, and then someone turned it into an animated gift and I like made a 3d version of that in my world here and uh, It's become like an iconic thing uh, Near the you've been ethoed. We got the diamond door. Oh, you guys remember the diamond door. <laughs> I Did a big thing where I teased people That we were gonna open it and then I would never open it. I did that for so many episodes Then eventually I opened it and there was another door behind it and that just that just got people so bad and then eventually we did open this, and you can see the reveal for that on episode 404 if you're curious. It was like a special episode as well. Um, and then eventually we actually did put something behind here. It's our redstone room. If we want to do a redstone project, it's like a safe place to work with a nice flat area. So at one point in the series, I got this idea that we're going to do biome enhancement. Um, so like the swamp biome, we built a giant canopy over that, and we were trying to add mushrooms and make it look like its own unique biome. Uh, same sort of deal with this desert. We had a big giant desert right next to the man cave. And it was just like a big flat yellow patch. And it's like, I want to make that look good somehow. I don't know how. Eventually I decided to build a city next to it, which we called Sandy City. And it's still a work in progress. <laughs> Has been for a long time. Uh, yeah, the man cave is just right over here. We got a gate to get into Sandy City. And I think, uh, let's just test this out. There's a switch that activates if we got Frostwalker on. I think. There we go. Gate automatically opens up. Oh, we fall down. And then automatically closes. That gets us entry into the city. Um, So we had this building here for a very long time. Um, wasn't super happy with the way it looked, and it discouraged me from building more houses here, so this is all we had for a long time. It's not really done either. There's no interiors to speak of. There's a bed. <laughs> uh, but then eventually I decided to change the style a little bit, and we got the stripped, uh, 
wood in the game as well. That made a huge difference for this area. And then I built a blacksmith building. It's a little bit cooler, you know. It's got its own unique style to it. Over here is a brewing system, auto brewing for night vision potions. And then the most recent building we added was this one over here. It's like a we got a market stall out in the front. We used to have a villager there, but he died. And then uh, no interior. <laughs> I'm working on it and just uh, just give me time guys. I've only had nine years cool cool And uh, if you check it out, we got a wall that runs all around the city which fortifies it We got three castle gates. It is super protected against mobs. No mobs can get in here during the nighttime It is absolutely great and then uh, Just outside this one We have a giant sugarcane farm. He's after me which uh, we used to use a lot to uh, trade with villagers. This was our main source of paper. And actually still is to this day. Can't get me. Just run along like this to harvest it. And just outside of Sandy City, we have this giant pyramid with a beacon on top. It's not really a pyramid. It's People keep telling me it's a zuggernaut or something. But uh, the main purpose of this was to hide the mob system. We had to build this above the ground and we had this big giant uh, clay cube for a long time it looked horrible so now we have like this uh, crazy looking thing <laughs> instead if we go through the other gate this direction there's not a lot of stuff this way but we do have a weird contraption for turning uh, yellow sand into orange sand there was a way of doing that for a while but it's been patched out of the game now the redstone contraption a little bit cheaty but not super cheaty <laughs> and then it would go down there um the plan is to maybe eventually expand out to the mountains, that's what these paths are for. We do have a couple things built up here. We got a woolly mammoth. Woolly mammoth hanging out up here along with our penguin. And this is one of our main ice farms for a long time. Um, a minecart runs underneath the pistons and it pushes all the ice up into a giant 10x10x10 10 by 10 by 10 cube of ice. So like a thousand ice blocks. Had to do the math. <laughs> when uh, it's ready for a full harvest, which is pretty cool. And uh, there's also one other little thing here. Oh, yeah, it's still here. I don't think this works now. Oh, it might be. Oh, there we go. It used to spell out etho and fire, but now the fire doesn't ignite when it uh, shoots underneath the block. Excellent. So we're almost done with this area. I think it's worth checking out the cactus farm here as well. This was a remake of an old, old farm I made uh, back before I even started YouTube. I had like three worlds before the Chocolate Island one there. <laughs> so I've been playing this game for a long time. Uh, originally this was made out of cobblestone though. And uh, the cactus would fall down the sides here into the streams below. I didn't know you could like block water with signs at the time. So I had to calculate exact lengths for everything for the water. Make sure there was no dead zones with it. <laughs> Then I had a way of going down here with pot lights uh, to light up the area. All the water would merge together and uh, end up over here, except without a hopper. I think when uh, clay got introduced into the game, the terracotta, I got like into a, a clay phase. <laughs> I thought it looked amazing. So we built a road uh, that leads up to the library area. And every one of these lamps turn on at nighttime. They each have it, their own daylight sensor. Good stuff. Let's keep on going here. So back when we started the biome enhancement project, my goal was to fill up our world a bit more, try to get it looking a bit nicer and fuller. And I took huge inspiration from B double O. He's a, he's a pretty good builder. <laughs> he always had these different areas in his world and he would connect them together with paths. So I started putting paths in my world as well to connect the different areas together. And it just, it helps so much. Makes it feel more alive. Like, uh, it's actually a lived in world, you know? Um, and also it just helps fill up space and then along the paths we have fences and uh, B-dubs was always big into making custom trees So I started making custom trees as well got some dark oaks out here. Uh, these are like custom like triple acacia trees mixed together <laughs> and then uh, changed the wood type out uh, Along with the biome enhancement project. We started uh, a giant wheat field over here. This used to be a plains biome Well, it still is but now it's like a little bit more interesting right we got a dugout there's a scarecrows in the field with hay bales there's a tractor 
And the big thing here is the windmill as well. We used to have a villager that lived in there, but he died eventually. <laughs> it's almost like a common theme with villagers. They always seem to die. And from this lake, we also have another river that goes out this way quite a ways. That's a man-made one as well. We blew it out with TNT, I think. And uh, <laughs> had to build a bridge over top of it here and a path that goes up to the Uvenithode. Um, we lined the banks of the river with some stone, like some cobblestone and leaves to make it a bit more interesting. And uh, there's a launcher here too. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to start checking out some of our key builds now. Probably the most important farm in our world, the one I use the most, <laughs> is the tree farm over here. So we mostly use this for the 2x2 two two spruce trees. The way this works is we grow the trees in the middle there. We climb up the water elevator and then we just face down. You can actually instantly break these if you have a hoe now, which is awesome. Get the pressure plate that launches some TNT from above. Well, it doesn't launch it, it drops it. And precise distances so it gets as much wood as possible without destroying anything. And then there's hoppers underneath all the carpet here to collect the drops together in a chest. And I'll probably add some kind of item sorter here eventually. I've also been using this for the new warp trees. If you replace the ground here with nylium, it works pretty good too. Um, further this way is a not so important build. <laughs> this is one of those ones we try to forget. Mm, yeah, I think it's jammed or busted or something. The lights used to like slowly turn on and off. It was like a dimmer switch on this guy. It's supposed to be the dragon. <laughs> It's not the best looking dragon and then I use those super bold color scheme down here And the plan was to like build a room to house our dragon egg it was gonna be at the end there and uh, let's, let's just say people weren't a fan of the color scheme and everything All right, everybody another big project you've probably been waiting for the nexus up ahead here is finally finished <laughs> Except for the outside, but uh, in terms of uh, complexity and size and definitely uh, time spent on a project this is the one that takes the cake in our world. Uh, the Nexus has been a very long ongoing project and it's just a giant storage room basically. In the front here we have a hexadecimal decoder that I designed myself and sounds fancy. Basically what that does is it takes two button presses, a code, and turns it into 256 different possibilities. And then we have a menu here for all the 256 items we store in the system. So we can choose what we want to pull out of storage, like 8D. We press 8D on our keypad. 8 and then D. We kind of got it laid out in the order they are. Uh, and then we pull the lever here. We should get some dirts delivered in the requested items. Or if we hit the buttons here, we can request, I think, between 16, 32, a stack, or two stacks of items for whichever one we press. And then if we want to put stuff in the storage room, we drop it off here, and it automatically gets sorted. And we're getting our dirt. It takes a bit of time to get delivered. That's the main flaw with this. Um, and then if we want to manually go check out the storage room and, and, and see things, we can go this way. This is where everything is actually stored. Um, it's basically in sets of four. Oh, there's some saplings over here. And there's an upstairs to it. We take the water elevator to go up to the second layer. There's also two sides to it, so it's absolutely massive. <laughs> like, just a huge, huge project. Of course we built it out of quartz, because why wouldn't we, right? Let's make it the cheapest thing in the world. And you can see the redstone from the hexadecimal decoder. It's a, a bit complicated. Go uh, game mode spectator maybe for a second here. Just to get a full, full idea of what we got going on here. So yeah, the wire branches 256 different ways. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> and then we got water streams that run throughout the whole thing here. These are to put the items into the item filters and sort things for us. Um, they also... Uh, take items out of the system and deliver them to us when we request an item. Right across from the Nexus is another one of our super important builds. This is our super smelter. The goal with this was to try see how quickly we could actually smelt things. So we have uh, something that takes items out at eight times hopper speed there. 
gets delivered to eight different minecarts. Those delivered to the furnaces. I think it's 128 furnaces or 256. I can't remember. They spelt them. Spelting always takes 10 seconds, though. There's no way to avoid that. And then it gets delivered here pretty quickly uh, at three times hopper speed, basically. And as you could imagine, a smelting system like that takes quite a bit of fuel, and that comes from our bamboozler. Flip the switch. And it uses bone meal to grow bamboo. We got four different bamboozlers hooked up together. This is like a bamboo farm I made myself. Um, if the trap door's open, it goes down and gets delivered automatically to all the furnaces in the super smelter. And we can also just manually collect it here if we need to take it somewhere else. This is the ray that uh, gets created. Causes a lot of lag though. <laughs> Also in this area, we got started on another new city we were going to build. This is a more modern style one. Uh, it's supposed to house villagers and stuff, but uh, haven't got too far with it. But I got a lot of praise for the design of it and the color scheme and everything. So we might continue on with this. People seem to like it, but it, it needs a lot of work, obviously. <laughs> I'm not super big on building, but, you know, I do it every once in a while. It's a, it's a good change of pace. Got another one of these indie brewing st stations for night vision. And there's a system here for getting items. We can choose between rockets, ender pearls, food, scaffolding, torches, bones, wood, stone. Uh, we choose our thing. And then uh, let's go for rockets, sure. And then we choose how many we want with this book. Roughly. <laughs> and you hit the button and we should get about 25 rockets. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not too sure. This might have broke from the redstone update because I can't get it to work now. I have a bit of a problem in this series where I love making mini games and I get them about 80% finished or so and then I just kind of stop working on them. <laughs> Usually because you guys are so bored of the redstone at that point, it's it's hard to continue and make it interesting. But uh, this is Mastermind recreated in Minecraft. It's close to finished, not quite. It's a guessing game. Basically, we had to create a, a bit of an AI for it because it's actually a two-player game. So our redstone handles the second player that generates a code secretly from us. We have to try to guess that code. We use shulker boxes to do that, which have concrete powder inside that gets shot out. And then we enter a guess over here. Uh, we stack, stack it up on the pistons. We use different colored concrete as the colored pegs in the game. There's six different colors you play with. And then when you enter your answer, you jump. One set of concrete goes down below and gets converted to item form. And then it gets matched with the, the secret code there to see what matches and what doesn't. And then the result gets displayed on the side panels here. This one never got finished. <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of hard to explain it. But uh, it's, it's a pretty cool game if we ever get it finished. Uh-huh. So also in this area, we have another pretty major farm. It's a dual farm. So this main area in the center is for pumpkins. They grow and then they automatically get harvested. When they uh, grow underneath the note block there, it gets detected and a piston breaks them. They all get delivered down in the chests here. And then we can use those for trading with villagers if we want. Uh, but also we got the brown mushroom farm on the side that goes all around this. And the way this works is there's actually, um, can we see them? There's mushrooms beside that in the dark, four of them. So we'll automatically grow a mushroom here over time. We don't have to plant it ourselves. And then you hit the button to grow. That dispenses bone meal to all the mushrooms. It goes all the way around. And then we harvest it with our axe. It's running along here. An instant break with efficiency. And then uh, after we harvest it all, we press that and water comes down and pushes all the blocks to the middle. Next to our big giant wheat field, we have a village that generated in a plains biome. This was an original testificate village when they did nothing in the game. <laughs> we tried to protect them for so long. We built fences around the area. We put lamps in there to keep it nice and bright, spam the torches, and uh, they survived in here for a very long time, but I think they all officially died now. Uh, we also upgraded their farms. Their all automated like that um we did a weird thing over here there's a nether portal actually i never use this thing anymore i i should like it still works perfectly fine 
there's a way of getting to the nether here though I used to transport them through there and uh let's see oh that's where they are <laughs> okay maybe they are still alive never mind i built a beacon there and then i emptied out the iron and i guess that's where they ended up uh-huh cool well that makes me happy <laughs> And then uh, right between the wheat field and the village, we built a path that that's kind of decorative. We made a fake lake here with some plants all around it, the plant monster over there. And then uh, we got a cool walk through the trees. We got some hanging lamps. These are all, well, I guess they're not really custom trees. I think we just added some logs at the bottom. And then it goes down to our chorus fruit farm. This is for farming up purple in our worlds. We smash the button up there with a bow or something. It shoots arrows out the top. Those land and hit the seeds, which pop off so that we have enough to replant this when we harvest it. We hit one of these buttons and that sends out water to harvest whatever's left to create the chorus fruit. It all gets washed down into a middle channel here and it's incredibly laggy. <laughs> Then the seeds get sorted out and end up in this chest so we can replant. The water automatically goes away on its own too. We have a bit of a path here with uh, some extra tall acacia trees. Give us some cover from the sun. And then this leads over to the blacksmith building, which is where the purper actually gets smelted. It runs down a water channel underground. And uh, I don't think there's an interior for this building. Nope, of course not. <laughs> you know, I should make that my goal in the future here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to finish up some of this stuff. But yeah, that chorus fruit ends up in the furnaces, and then it smelts, and we can make purple out of the, the fruit. Just like so. Awesome. So we are just about done with the main area. We just got a couple more builds, and then we're going to head off to the nether and check out some of our farther away stuff. So first off, the guardian farm. We've been working on this more recently, but uh, originally we built this Guardian farm in 1.8 when Guardians came out. Uh, it just so happens my world, there was a Guardian farm underground here because... It's a little hard to explain, but <laughs> my world was generated before jungles were even in the game. And once I think they added jungles, they changed how seeds generate, like the which biomes go where. So if you generate my world now with the same seed... This is actually ocean where we're standing, and there's a guardian farm right in this area. So if I mined out the ground and put water there, it would spawn guardians, and that's what we did. And uh, recently we added a mural telling the story about the elder guardian we put on top of the windmill. Got a mini guardian temple there. We transported the elder guardian through the nether and stashed him on top of the windmill, where he later despawned for reasons we don't know. <laughs> Uh-huh. So, uh, if we go down over here, this is where the actual killing chamber and storage is for it. Fall down. And here they are. They're constantly getting burnt. Stuff automatically gets sorted into the chests, as you would expect. And then some cook stuff there. When I craft stuff, I store it over here. Um, and then there's a manual kill mode. I think that gets rid of the lava. And there's also a way of sending them to the nether. Yeah, let's go check out the nether thing, actually. So when we hit that switch to go to the nether, it makes a water bucket come out here. And pistons extend so they can't go down anymore. And they just funnel through the nether portal. Let's go creative. <laughs> let's go back to spectator. Oh, snappers. They end up in this ch uh, chamber here where we used to kill them with instant damage potions and stuff. Uh, now that mob cramming is a thing in the game, we can't store like 200, 300 here like we used to. <laughs> so it's not really used anymore. And something we worked on just last episode actually is a new version of the Ender Porter, which is a system for teleporting large distances in your world. You can store Ender Pearls on bubble columns now very easily. And then you use redstone to trigger another one of these... Uh, at another area in your world that you want to teleport to. So if you look at our coordinates, we're at minus 240, 700. We hit the button. 
that triggers the Ender Pearl at our other base location here, at our stronghold. And now we're at minus 470 and 850. So we traveled a long distance there. We set up another Ender Pearl for next time we want to teleport. We can go back if we want to the, the temple. And let's go to the stronghold, actually, because that's probably what we want to see next. But man, we got so much stuff left to see. I thought we could do this tour in an hour and a half, but I, I know it's not going to happen now. <laughs> So at the stronghold base, uh, we've made many attempts at starting new bases in our world. We uh, have a giant mob system here. This is an old school version. They kind of get trapped in here now. It's not super good. Uh, there's also a lighting system with this so we can turn it on and off. We go flip this lever, all the lights turn on. Oh, I think we got to do it to the, all the torches actually. Oh yeah, it's not even controlled altogether. Why didn't I put them all together? <laughs> uh, oh, let's go spectator. So yeah, all the lights are on here, so they should stop spawning. But otherwise, they fall down into an area here. We have a mob sorting system. Oh, I think it does actually work. It's just messed up. Look at the pistons. We got an arm out and the arm's over there. I think we got to replace it for some reason. I don't know why they broke. Or when. <laughs> oh, let's get that one back there. So if we do that, then uh, creepers get stored to the left, zombies over there, the baby guys, and then uh, skeletons get one way. I think because we we uh, squeezed them it through too quickly there, that got messed up a bit. But uh, there's also a system here for making the skeletons shoot the creepers, and then they would explode wherever we wanted them to, uh, down over here somewhere. And uh, there's also a chamber here they used to land down. Like creepers, zombies, and skeletons would get separated there. Uh, the plan was to make a base location over here after the man cave a long, long time ago. I have a bad habit of not following through with my secondary bases, though, because <laughs> we got so much stuff at the man cave, it's hard to leave it behind. But yeah, the plan with this was to build our base above uh, end portal and silverfish farm. We made a silverfish farm by <laughs> detecting when they enter the blocks, and then we would generate new stone blocks at a, a stone generator over here with lava above. Uh, then the silverfish blocks would get uh, funneled down a chain and stacked together into a big block. And this was a way of storing XP back before it was possible. Uh, there was exactly enough silverfish blocks here to get you to 50 levels, I believe, and do one enchantment. <laughs> so the idea was to keep this constantly running while we worked on our base. Uh, we gotta go survival. And then when we were ready, we would harvest it. And I think we used to have like snow golems and all kinds of stuff to get these guys out of the blocks. And then we started using poison potions. And it creates like a runaway chain effect where they all hatch at once. <laughs> oh my goodness, I missed doing that. That was so cool. Oh, there was one stone block. Uh-huh. We also had ways of like sending them through the nether to go do mining at, at locations. There's like an, a portal system here. There's a whole bunch of crazy, wacky stuff that uh, didn't make any sense. Oh, I don't know what that does. Oh, that lets them free. And there was also a tunnel that we would transport them through. Um, they would walk on one side, we would be on the other side of the glass. And we also got a couple other random builds nearby the stronghold base that's probably worth mentioning. The ice tray, this was like the original ice farm. Uh, eventually this biome changed so water doesn't freeze here anymore. <laughs> but we had a whole system for like seeding the ice blocks. Pistons would go down or up. We, we would put them down when we wanted the water buckets dispensed and it would fill the area with water and then we would put the blocks up so that it would freeze faster. And then down when we wanted to harvest the ice. Nearby here, we also got the zombie purifier. Ooh. <laughs> we made a whole giant contraption here for turning zombie villagers into villagers. There was a zombie spawner back there. Uh, you used to be able to get zombie villagers from spawners. You can't anymore, as far as I know. Um, and then we had a lighting switch to turn it on and off. And then there was a junction if we wanted to send... The zombie villagers to the curing stations, they would land down here. Otherwise, they would go to a killing spot here for the regular zombies. Okay, I think I got it figured out. So, it only works if there's a zombie villager in here. 
it turns on some lights and the tripwire gets activated. And then when we hit the medicine button, oh, that was really flu. <laughs> Only the ones that have the zombies in will have the weakness potions dispensed. Otherwise, it doesn't waste them. And I think there's also... Oh yeah, and then when they would get cured, that would get them out of the station with this button. And then there's a furnace minecart to get them through the portal. <laughs> and uh, coal here, in case you need it, some extra apples for curing them. Man, there's a bunch of stuff out here I kind of forgot about. We don't really go in this area anymore, but this used to be our sand farm. Then we used to fight a bunch of withers out here. We got our silverfish pit with a bunch of silverfish stored up. And uh, we also built a 360 cannon out here I totally forgot about. This was a tribute to my olden days, back before I was even on YouTube, back before Minecraft. I was on a server for, like, PvP, before survival Minecraft was even possible on servers. A bunch of people, like, were big into making cannons there. <laughs> and I designed a 360 cannon uh, that I was pretty proud of. Did it blow up? No, it didn't blow up. I don't know how it works anymore, though. This is like a remake of it. It's a little bit fancier than the old one. Oh, I remember how it works. Okay, I think we gotta choose where we want to shoot by throwing the TNT in the hoppers here. Again, this is a remake, so the original one was not this fancy. And then it'll, it'll use those as the ammo. There we go. Did it blow up? It blew up. <laughs> I expected no less. I think we finally covered everything in the main area. We can start heading to the nether. We skipped over the... Crimson Wood and Warped Wood Farm here. We just built this recently. It's a redstoneless version. Excellent. So let's head back to Sandy City. There's a secret nether portal down here. Land on the pressure plate. It pushes us into the portal. And then it closes behind us. And we're finally into the nether. Our nether hub is right over here. Oh, I love this place. <laughs> so uh, we got four main branches. Tunnels that uh, go off four different directions here to all our important builds. This one is mostly just for farming. We got a sand farm and ice farm down this way. Nothing else really, so we probably won't end up going there. Uh-huh, so something we just did recently actually is we mapped out our nether and marked a lot of the key locations with banners. We're gonna be checking out some of these in just a second. You'll notice a lot of our nether portals have uh, buttons on. These are for lighting and uh, shutting off portals. And some of them will light it and then shut it off after we go through. Um, this is part of the portal network, which doesn't work anymore. But we used to have codes to going to different locations. Uh, we would set the code by the delay on the repeaters. And then it would break all the portals that aren't that code. And then it would light the only one that was. I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this, but basically if a portal wasn't available, if it wasn't lit, it would search up to 128 blocks in the nether for another one that was. So you could control which one you wanted to go to that way and basically get a free thousand block uh, teleport from the overworld to the nether and then you go through the different nether portal you ended up at. And it was all linked together with two-way repeaters and there was a decoding system to figure out which portal you would go to based on the repeater strength, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's, uh, check out some other stuff that's a little easier to understand. We got a light show that goes around here. Mm-hmm. We also got the Decodonizer 9000 at the hub here, so I was very stubborn about building an iron farm, and I was wasting a lot of iron on buckets, so we made a way to buy them. It would empty the cod out of the buckets, and then they end up in here. No, over here. Yeah. And we also have a horse swapping station. We could choose between a mule or a fast horse for going down our nether tunnels. If we wanted to transport stuff, we would pick the mule. But uh, the game has changed quite a bit since then. <laughs> we got shulker boxes and ice roads and all kinds of better ways of getting around now and moving things. Uh, we got blue ice running down the center of our roads here so we can get around very quickly now. And I'm thinking we'll want to skip a lot of the transport time down the nether just to save episode time. Because <laughs> it's getting super long. Uh, but we got about 10,000 blocks of nether tunnels, I think, at this point. It's pretty insane. Uh, this is Slab City, guys. This was another attempt at making a new base. The restriction for this one is we had to build using 9 by 4 chunks of building materials. And... Uh, <laughs> 
It was a cool thought, but at the same time, it also made it extremely difficult to decorate. So I struggled a lot with this, and I don't know if we're going to continue it or not. I'll see what you guys say about it, but uh, I found it really hard to make it look good because um, by nature, we have to keep the walls flat. And if you want to make things look good in Minecraft, it can't be flat because uh, then you don't get the shadows and stuff. Unless you're using shaders, it's a different story. Well, we had a concrete maker over here, just a simple one where we could uh, turn the dust into uh, solid concrete. We had a minecart storage system here as well. So let's say we were looking for a block like pink concrete. I don't know if that'll show up. Oh yeah, there's some in there. We also had a tree farm system. So we would get our saplings. Is it automated? Oh, it tried. <laughs> tried to grow it. What about this one? Moving on. <laughs> the next stop in our nether journey is the amplified base, guys. So uh, at one point in the series, when amplified terrain became a possibility, we did update our world. That was one like uh, outside of the game adjustment we made to our world. So now we get amplified terrain when we explore further out. And we tried to make this place work a bit, but uh, <laughs> it became just a big mess, basically. Um, there's a clock over here that would sync itself to the proper time. I don't think we ever finished that. Um, let's see. The idea was to use like a bunch of slime launchers to get around this place. And then slime blocks kind of broke for a few years. Well, we had a bunch of slime launchers. For getting up the mountains and stuff these work now though which is kind of cool they were broken for a long time um let's see here we had oh i forgot about that that's like a tree farm this is a cool thing though we had a way of moving a bunch of minecarts like a storage system made out of storage minecarts we hit the button and they would automatically move to the next station in our amplified base area uh, I think the next one on the list is over here. They should end up over here if it still works. Yep, here they come, and everything goes in the exact same order, which is pretty cool. And then there's one more station after this, and then they end up back at the first one there. We had some kind of weird chicken farm here, too. <laughs> they would, like, get shot out and fall down a, a big hole here. And this area is a flower forest, so at the very top of the hill, we actually had a flower farm which uh, I don't think works very well. It's okay, it's okay. It's just uh, not the best. We'd have to manually plant them. Next stop down our nether tunnel is the Mesa Mining Zone. We had a way of uh, sending out storage minecarts to where we would do our mining. Uh, we would send as many as we wanted, and then we would hop on ourselves and go there. Uh, most of this is uh, kind of mined out. We use shulker boxes nowadays. For moving stuff so that's all kind of pointless <laughs> but when we would return the storage minecarts full of the clay it would go up into a sorting system and it would all organize according to its color in the chests so white would go in here and light gray in here that sort of thing uh also in this area is drearyville up these stairs let's head over there and uh do the special and you know i think we're gonna change it up this time just for a bit of variety because we've seen this uh, show several times at this point We've never seen it with shaders on before. <laughs> so this is Drearyville. It's a little village up in the mountain, a mining village. Uh, this is our disgruntled villager. This is where the tunnel leads up to. And we hit the button that says do not press. Off he goes into his little hideaway. And uh, I think most of you know what's going to happen now. Oh, you can see the light through the wall. Holy smokes. <laughs> He uh, hops on his flamethrower and he just burns the world down, guys. The whole village is going up in flames. We built the entire thing out of wood, so it would be totally flammable. There's coal blocks in here. We got the minecart that goes up to the coal deposit up there. And... We've got random TNT hidden all over the place, so it's like constantly blowing up under trees and... Oh, I just love this thing. I always have... I always get a kick out of uh, watching this. The power. The, bow the power behind that flamethrower is insane. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. 
That's the big finale to the whole show. And moving on again, the next stop down our nether hub is our giant ice farm. We uh, just go down here with our silk touch. The water kind of collects it together. Yeah, we just kind of keep going along here, and then we get to the edge, and then the piston thing launches us forward, and then we press left on our keyboard, and we start going the other way. All the water channels merge together, and then they go up a bubble elevator and into the storage over here. And don't forget about the Crimson Keep. This is a newer project we've been working on since the Nether update came out. Uh, the general idea is to take a bastion and turn it into a fancy bastion. Mm hmm. <laughs> so we've uh, got some basics down here. We're switching out the ground with Nilium, building bridges, acacia trap doors for railing. And the big thing we got built at the moment is a. Uh, piglin bartering system so we put the gold in up here and then it gets delivered to 12 different uh, piglins and then uh, runs through a bunch of item filters at four times hopper speed <laughs> and we can get a lot of items very quickly if we got the gold which we generally don't have yet but yeah all the items we get from the piglins get automatically sorted into the chests according to where they belong which is pretty nice Cool, so that's another branch done in our nether hub. Now we're back here. I want to go in spectator mode and just show you what we got going on in the area. So up above our nether hub is a gold farm that kind of got abandoned. This was our first attempt at it. And then we rebuilt another one above that, which still kind of functions. This is what we call gold farm number one nowadays. And the way this works is a, a zombie pigman spawns he gets pushed off by the pistons. There's some tripwires. Um, and there's a lot of spawning space here, actually. And they get pushed down into these nether portals all over the place. And then over at this end, we have some buttons for controlling that. That one's for lighting it. Usually we keep these off because otherwise it causes a lot of lag when they go through. We can break them with that button. And there's also a giant cage all around this thing to stop gas from blowing it up and then when the zombie piglins go through the portals they end up over here in the overworld so this is the portal they would come through uh, they fall down then there's a crushing system to get them down to a one hit kill we throw instant damage potions at them and we get all their xp and then there was a bunch of hoppers below that it goes to a sorting system i think up a dropper elevator over here and then all the drops get organized in the chest. And we got a villager here for trading if we want to. Um, zombie flesh in there. Chicken junk and extra garbage in that one. And uh, overall, this is kind of a nice little build. I like the way it looks. There's a path here for getting to the library and for sending enchanted books. Uh, there was a zipper elevator. Those don't work anymore. <laughs> Then if we go a little bit above this gold farm, on top of our roof, there's another gold farm up there. We got a basalt generator. We have a shulker box loading system for putting the drops from the pigmen into shulker boxes. So those get broken automatically and put down in the chest below when they're full. Up above that though, at the very top of our nether, this is the spawning spaces for our zombie pigmen. We added some soul torches to scare the piglins off and they fall down. And then uh, the pigmen try to get to us. They fall down these chambers on all four sides. And then there's some piston pushing systems to get their drops. Where'd that gas come from? <laughs> I think he spawned on the basalt, actually. Um, it gets all the drops together in the middle here. And the XP gets launched up a system to us at the top there as we AFK. And then uh, all the items go down these chambers here to the chalker box loaders. Yeah, look at this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they want to spawn here for sure. You know, I think we might be getting a little closer to the finish now. I, I can kind of see the finish line in sights. My voice is really starting to give out though. This has been torture. Two hours of an episode. Never again. <laughs> we'll probably do it in the next tour again. Uh, okay, so this is our dual blaze farm. This has this was a key build in our world. One of our main XP farms for a long time because blazes give 10 XP per kill. Unlike most mobs that only give 5. So they get gathered together. 
um, down these two cones and then picked up by some minecarts at the bottom there. They get brought up and then uh, they ram into a cactus at the top there and it, they fall down the chamber. Oh, there goes the guy. Oh yeah, and the pistons squeeze them together and down the middle. They land on a iron pressure plate and as more of them accumulate, more and more lights turn on. And it used to be when it would get to five lights, we would get uh, 30 levels or something when we'd kill them all. But now the mob cramming prevents that from happening. Um, we kill them. There's a minecart, hopper minecart below that picks up the drops and they go down to a system we just built recently down over here. And as well, we got a potion lab down here. There was a way of extracting water from sponges. <laughs> Just, uh, we got a build here for doing that. I'm not going to demonstrate it, though. We're low on time. But we could uh, put wet sponges in a furnace, and then it would extract the water. All right, and then further down this tunnel, any of you that have played Castle Crashers might recognize the frog there. And this ends up at a nether fortress. This is where we farm wither skeletons. We got the whole area slabbed. Um, there's a portal here. This takes us over to our Gas Blaster Tree Thousand. Another uh, tree farm design we did. This one's pretty special, though. Because you get attacked when you go through. He's going to burn everything down. No, we got him. Yeah, we got a gas trapped in the overworlds. Oh, man. And then when we stand here, it would open up the trap door. The gas can shoot at us, and the water pushes the ball down. So it would explode on the wood above the hoppers and it would collect the wood without losing any. Oh, I think I figured it out actually. So we stand on the pressure plates, the gas shoots at us, he can't hit us because of the water. And then we hold right click with our saplings, grows the tree, and it glitches out. <laughs> uh huh, I think it's safe to say that one's broken at the moment. <laughs> if we follow the beacons up here, we punched a hole through the ceiling so we can get on top of the roof. And this is where we have another gold farm slash iron farm slash uh, villager trading system and gas farm. <laughs> Everything all in one. And it works while we are farming wither skeletons below that we'll still get iron, which is pretty neat. Um, villagers are sleeping right now, but every so often it will spawn in some iron golems on the platform. Oh, yeah, it kind of worked at the moment. You got to spend a bit of time here uh, for it to get fully ramped up. They fall down. They try to hit the zombie pigmen in the middle there, but they fall down. And then the horde kills them below. And then there's a minecart that runs underneath that to pick up all the drops. With a filter system. The minecart gets one of each of these as it's, it begins its journey. And then uh, passes underneath the grounds through a big maze of uh, rails, and then clicks all the drops above, delivers them to a sorting system down below, and then we can pick up our, our goodies over here. Moving on once again, the final branch of our nether hub has three main builds we could check out. First stop is the witch farm. It's uh, definitely in need of more work still. It's not very decorated, but the witches spawn up above. They fall down, land on the hoppers, die, and all their drops get collected together over here. Um, I've actually had a big problem in my world with finding witch farms. You can see we got the area pretty lit up, which is good. Because we started the world so early, it was before witch farms were a thing. <laughs> and then we switched to Amplified, so it's like impossible to find a flat area to actually build one without having to remove giant mountains and stuff or light them up. But yeah, they spawn over here and then the shifting floors drop them down below. Uh, this is good for the most part, but a little bit of the mountains are within range of where we stand, so it's not the most efficient farm, and it's only a single farm, and I find there's much better ways of getting redstone, actually, so I don't use it too often. At the very end of this very long nether tunnel, we have the underwater base, guys. Yet again, another one of our unfinished bases. <laughs> this is the one I'm most likely to return to, though. Uh, I think it has the most potential. We did a couple wacky builds here. We have an underwater tree farm. It definitely takes a bit of time. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so it does grow. <laughs> so on the retraction of the blocks, it leaves a little air pocket for a brief moment. And in that moment, we have to try grow the tree. Uh, if we step here, it rem removes the oak block in the way. 
and then there's a dispenser here for more saplings. And I guess it grows leaves underwater now. That's a new thing. <laughs> it used to just leave the wood. We got a sea pickle farm over here. I don't think I want to demonstrate that, though. I don't think it works too well. We have an underwater enchanting station. Same kind of gimmick. We have to activate the enchanting at the exact moment the bookshelves retract. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we right-click the note block. They extend, and then they retract. Leave some air pockets built behind so we can get to level 30 that way otherwise the water blocks them we also got a hostile mob system in this area it's mostly to stop drown mobs from spawning and attacking us if uh, we got the regular guys spawning it cuts down on the mob cap they uh, spawn on the platforms and then they move into a water elevator here which is a pretty good design actually they get flown up a bubble elevator to the top they fall down at the end here and land over here and there's also a way of switching it i think that makes some pistons extend and then they end up over here and we can manually kill them if we want to i guess there's a light system for the farm i don't know what that's about i think there is actually oh yeah check it out we got lamps above the spawning pads so when those are on it's too bright for them to spawn on the platforms and then we'll start getting a bunch of drowned guys spawning in the water around us and the final build to check out through our nether hub is the pillager outpost. So this was one of those pillager structures. We bulldozed and we made a farm out of it just for the, the funds of it. <laughs> I actually had plans on uh, making this into a raid farm. There used to be a way of spawning multiple raids at the same time. And then that kind of got patched out of the game. So now it's kind of just a gimmicky, goofy farm. Iron golems in the middle to attract the pillagers into these bubble elevators they go up and then fall down in the middle here and it actually works pretty good as a xp farm and if for some reason we want to farm crossbows this is the way to do it too yeah that goes down into a system here for separating the junk i think we just press q <laughs> oh and it doesn't land in the lava it lands on the ledge i forgot about that I was supposed to fix that well this is it everybody we've seen everything in the main world and also everything connected through the nether hub this tunnel goes from the man cave to the stronghold base and this is how we get to the end we save the end for the end so there's three main things to check out here first off is the ender ender 1.0 this was the original enderman farm uh, if you don't know the history behind this, this is pretty key to current Enderman farms that exist today. I had the idea of building an Enderman farm off away from the main island. In the past, people used to flood those and light them up, and uh, it never really worked out too well. <laughs> so I built one way off from the island, and uh, I made a spawning pad system up above here, just the standard flat. They spawn on the pressure plates and get pushed down sort of thing. Get down to a one hit kill if we brought a horse over here we could ride around to to punch him to death <laughs> and uh it's kind of funny i think it was during one of my episodes i was here like looking at the guys and farming them up and it's like you know i originally just made this for collecting ender pearls and i was like wait a minute i'm getting tons of xp doing this and uh kind of realized this is one of the best ways of making an xp farm in the game Again, this was back when you needed 50 levels and all that kind of stuff. Then eventually we outgrew that one and we started a second Enderman farm. Out over this one, this one's much more refined. We used the vine trick that the zip crowd figured out for stacking multiple platforms together. And yeah, I remember building this thing. I think I stayed up to like 6 a.m. that night. <laughs> Took like over 10 hours or something crazy. This, this thing is huge. Lots and lots of layers to it. The gimmick with this one, though, is I figured out uh, we could use TNT and flame bows to farm them all at once instead of using our sword. Although I guess you can't uh, do that anymore, can you? Oh, the water puts the flame bow out now. It didn't used to. It would shoot through it. Although, <laughs> this is going to be hard to demonstrate. I guess this is broken now. We gotta shoot that and then put the water back, otherwise it'll blow up the farm. 
But yeah, that's what it would do. It would blow up all the Endermen. We'd get all the XP still. And if we stood here, all the XP orbs would slowly flow towards us. And we got the enchanting station. With this Enderman farm, we also had a system for moving Ender Pearls through these water streams that would go up to the main island and then uh, that would go through the Ender Portal back to the overworld and that uh, true spawn thing we saw earlier in the episode. So we can automatically store Ender Pearls that way. Off this direction is the Ender Ender 3.0. This is the one we currently use. And it still works pretty good. Although generally, if you're building an Enderman farm, it's better to build it lower in the world so you get better spawn rates. But uh, yeah, we got like a pixel art design here. The Enderman looking, getting ready to fight the dragon. They're mortal enemies. Um, giant spawning pad here for the Enderman. They get attracted to an Endermite in a minecart. And then they fall down. Over here. Oh. And when there's Endermen here, there's a music box thing that plays. <laughs> kind of loud. Uh, we can stand here, sweeping edge them. You can collect XP faster than uh, we can absorb it with this farm, so it's pretty much maxed out as it is. But yeah, there's a music randomizer below this that uh, constantly plays and generates random notes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And I think that's about all there is to it, so let's wrap up the episode here. Man, that was a long tour, wasn't it? Well, it feels like I swallowed some thumbtacks. My voice is absolutely shot at this point, but I think we did it. I think we covered all the important stuff. Obviously, we skipped over a few things, but I think we got all the key builds. So let's head over to our fireworks uh, shack here and pull the lever, as we usually do to finish up these specials. We got a bunch of fireworks hidden in the lake. Uh, they don't work anymore. <laughs> oh, you know why? The, I think the dispensers are facing sideways and now uh, they shoot sideways instead of going up. So all the fireworks are exploding underground. <laughs> oh, right. That's, that's a d little different this time. Um... And obviously we're going to be deleting this world after we're done with this tour. This is a backup, like I said before. Uh, this is not our real Let's Play world. I checked it out, and yep, that's what the problem was. They're facing sideways, so let's just end it in the man cave. I think this is a fitting end for the episode. And we're going to do a reverse comment of the day today to save my voice a little bit. It says, what is your favorite build in the Let's Play world? And I'm the one asking the question this time. <laughs> so let me know. In the comments of all the stuff we checked out today, guys, what was your favorite thing we've done so far? I'm curious. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up here. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tour. Hopefully it wasn't too, too long, even though it was. <laughs> and I really appreciate you guys still watching the series. You know, we're still doing pretty good. The views are still um, much like they were many years ago, so... Yeah, there's definitely still interest with uh, what we've been doing and uh, got big plans going forward here. So I hope you guys enjoy that as well. But I really appreciate it with uh, you guys sticking around still. It's funny, I look at my demographics and it's like I used to get 33% of my viewers were under the age of 18 and now it's like 5%. <laughs> and all you guys have grown up and you're like in your 20s and 30s now and you're still watching the series. I think a lot of you, so it's, it's pretty cool. You're kind of aging with me and the series. So, yeah, thanks for sticking with me all this time. Um, and if anyone's new, like, thank you for uh, joining me, too. So, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. Have yourselves a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.